This is um, what a national security letter under the Patriot Act looks like, and it's a request for data. Um, this one, in fact, was issued to uh, an internet service provider operator called Nick Merrill, who was gagged by this order for seven years and had a really grueling uh, and draining fight to first even be able to talk to a lawyer and then to get this permanent ban, uh, which meant he couldn't speak about this to anybody. Uh, it took him seven years. And, and in fact, the national security letter can only apply to communications data, to metadata. This is not a request. This is a, a diagram produced by the American Civil Liberties Union uh, about 2006, which they call the NSA Surveillance Octopus. And it's extrapolating from documentation that Mark Klein <coughs> brought with him. Uh, and there's a diagram there of a splitter in room 641A. And basically, by looking at that documentation, they were able to extrapolate that probably this splitter room didn't just exist in San Francisco, it existed in many of the other major switching centers as well. So this is not, as it were, a request for data. This is a state of continuous mass surveillance, continuous monitoring of the data, content and uh, metadata. Uh, and the reason I mention that, and I'll, I'll come back to this, is, is because if you look at all of the uh, European regulatory language in data protection, what data protection authorities have to say <coughs> about uh, law enforcement, they invariably talk about law enforcement, they don't talk about national security, they always talk about requests for data going through some sort of legal process. There is just no acknowledgement in data protection regulatory consciousness that what was exposed in warrantless wiretapping actually exists. And of course, before that, with Echelon, literally nothing. You can go through, I guess, 200 opinions of the Article 29 Working Party for the conclave of European national data protection authorities. There is no concept of, of this continuous mass surveillance existing. So this slide was titled, Is Cloud Valence a Real Risk? And I guess since <laughs> two days ago, we have to say, yeah, it is. But the point I wanted to make with this slide is encryption can only protect data in the sense from, you know, through secure sockets there, from your machine to the front door of a cloud data center, where it's decrypted so it can be processed. And when you look back at some of those reports that were written for the European Commission and by other bodies, and you sort of look at what these policy type people have said about you know, computer security and encryption, it's all waffle. They completely blur the issue that in cloud processing, encryption is sort of futile. Because if you're worried about, as it were, the insider risk of a law like FISA getting this surveillance done on the inside, well, <laughs> encryption doesn't help you. I mean, because the data is going to be available, decrypted. And there's something kind of more interesting, which, which is the, if you like, the most powerful form of cloud computing for the future is something called platform as a service. Uh, and this is essentially, you use a language like Hadoop, a pure functional programming language, where the properties of the language mean that you can write a program in such a way that will then scale, maybe in a few hundreds of milliseconds, from one machine to thousands of machines. So this means if you're running, say, a call center, uh, and as the, sort of, as the world turns and customers wake up, and then your call center gets wham, hit with uh, lots and lots and lots of new customers, then the same application can elastically expand according to that demand. So it's a very attractive way to write new systems because you don't have to re-architect your code all the time. But think about the implications of this for mass surveillance. If you wanted to do mass surveillance on those sort of applications, well, you'd need a, a kind of hundred or maybe a thousand narrowest boxes on standby because what you've got to do is basically disentangle the data, go up the protocol stack and find out the meaning of the data within whatever application is being used. Now, DPI boxes can do this, but essentially they're reconstructing all of those protocols uh, artificially and, and sort of separately. So to cope with this elastic demand of cloud computing, you, you'd have to have all these boxes on standby. So in the future, if governments are going to do this, and they probably, well, if they are already, uh, they're going to have to co-opt the cloud provider. The, the, the people who write the fabric of the software that powers the cloud, they're going to have to approach them and say, can you put in some wiretapping subroutines, you know, in, in this part of the code. In fact, all over the code. So essentially, while the data is being processed, there is also the capability to scan the data and to do all of this in parallel in a way which will scale elastically. 
And there's even, um, uh, you know, in the open literature, a proposal to do this. In fact, it's the European Telecommunications Standards Institute in one of their specs uh, last year, draft spec, that coined this acronym LIAAS, Lawful Intercept as a Service. And the concept is just as I've described. It's using the power of the cloud to wiretap the cloud in software. So what's different from the Echelon agenda of more than 10 years ago is that was only about communications. And communications, in principle, you can protect with encryption. You can encrypt it from A to B, and you don't necessarily then care, providing you trust your encryption, where it goes in the middle. But here, with cloud valence, if data was formally processed on-premise, in Europe, it'd be pretty secure. If you move that data into some other country's cloud within range of their jurisdiction and these sorts of laws, well, potentially it's all EU data in the future that then could become subject to this sort of surveillance. So, from about 2009, uh, the, the, the big IT industry and the data protection authorities knew they had a problem, both of them. I mean, the IT industry had to sell the cloud, the data protection authorities realized they knew nothing about the cloud, but they're a bunch of lawyers, and they wanted some way to kind of keep earning their money as, as regulators doing their job as bureaucratic lawyers, um, so they got together. And from about 2009, I noticed little huddles between some of the data protection authorities and some of the people I definitely didn't trust in my own industry, in my own company. And they came up with essentially a sleight of hand. The proposition is this. What Microsoft and Google want is a sort of certification for their platform, like Azure or Office 365 or Google Apps. And they want essentially a blessing from the data protection authorities that this is secure. Data protection authorities said, okay, well, we'll give you kind of a very long checklist of boxes to tick, and then you've got to go off to a private sector auditor and get yourself security audited. We don't understand security, but if you go to a reputable private sector auditor, all of the ISO standards and the SAS rules and all the other things, then that's good enough for us. <coughs> then everybody's happy, right? Well, no, because the problem of this mass surveillance from inside the data center under national security laws then disappears in a puff of audit. That's the basic maneuver. So the name given to this maneuver was binding corporate rules for processors. Snappy number, it rolls off a tongue. Um, and I call this a Maginot line in cyberspace because um, if we look at what the, the data protection authorities back last year said about this, um, they basically had an opinion which said, the existing mechanisms for legitimating transfer of data from Europe are all fine, we can make them work, they're beautiful, they're lovely, but in fact, because of the fuss that I'd begun to make about this privately already, they did slip in this, this paragraph at the end as a sort of caveat in saying that it's really important that access to personal data for national security, which was an advance, it's one of the earliest first references uh, to, to national security in their literature, and law enforcement, it's really important that only mutual legal assistance treaties are used. And mutual legal assistance treaties are formal agreements between governments bilaterally that are for defined <coughs> areas of criminal law enforcement. So they're not valid for political stuff. So if you believe, as it were, in legal control over this sort of thing, that's as good as you're going to get. Because it means, essentially, if the United States was to go outside that, then they would be breaking a formal treaty with another country which is a pretty serious thing to do. But then Article 29 said, well, how can we actually ensure that this is really done? And they referenced this rather bureaucratic regulation that actually goes back to the Helms-Burton Act imposing extraterritorial sanctions on Cuba. And what that was all about was when a European company that might want to do business with Cuba, if that company also did business in the United States, they could be sanctioned by the United States just for, as it were, being within range of US jurisdiction. And the EU said, no, no, we're not, we're not having that. So this council regulation said essentially that they could disregard uh, any attempt by the US government to impose sanctions. Well, that's all very well, but that's clearly not going to work for this case, because the whole point about this secret extraterritorial surveillance is it's secret. You're never going to know it's happening. So this seems to be a completely futile uh, kind of bureaucratic attempt. To, 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 to undo the damage that already by this stage been done. So uh, 
I won't go into all the details of what's entailed in these BCRs for processes and their genesis, but I've already made the point that, you know, kind of newsflash for data protection authorities, private sector auditors, lawful secret national security laws, lawful in that country, that's not part of their threat model. That's not what they audit for. They audit for external threats, for hackers and viruses and people trying to do bad things to this and outside. If somebody from one of the big auditing companies came across you know, a data center and said, oh, what's that secret room for? Well, they wouldn't be told, you know? I mean, <laughs> there, there would be no way that essentially, as part of the audit contract, <coughs> that any reputable auditor would take that on as part of their mission. But, yes. Aha. Okay. Better speed up a bit. But, but anyway, um, gosh, I'm way behind. <laughs> the, the, lo the loopholes have already been built in, because when you look in the small print of these BCRs and processes, you find basically that if a data controller or data a cloud provider gets one of these secret orders, well, sorry, gets an order from a foreign government, then they're supposed to tell the customer back in Europe. In fact, they're supposed to tell the data subject, unless it's prohibited to do so. Well, guess what? It is. <laughs> So I've got here a sort of little matrix, a sort of risk matrix, of the categories of data. On the left, I want to make the point that we've really got three categories of data. There's criminal stuff, there's sort of genuine bona fide national security stuff, and then there's this political and foreign policy stuff. So roughly speaking, kind of we're okay with intra-EU uh, for criminal and national security stuff. In the top right, it's pretty dodgy for things like passenger name record data, if you've looked into sort of the treaties that were concluded without that, so that's full of loopholes. <coughs> There's big, big problems in those two red areas because that's totally unprotected. You're not protected by the Fourth Amendment, as we discussed. You're not protected by EU data protection. You're not prevented by Council of Europe Convention 108. You're not prevented by the Cybercrime Treaty, and you're not covered by ECHR. And as I sort of kick out all of this, um, I, I, if I had more time, I, uh, I could say a few words of appreciation about our wonderful data protection authority in this country, the Information Commissioner. Uh, all I'd say is this is rather typical, but basically in some guidance he issued last year, if his view is that if a cloud provider or a, a data controller in this country enters into one of these cloud arrangements, and then if data is handed off for Pfizer or Patriot, you get off scot-free. There's no intention, already a kind of preemptive cringe by the British Data Protection Authority to say this problem's too hard, we're turning a blind eye. 